You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello and welcome to the Driving Law Podcast. I am Kyla Lee at Acumen Law and today we're going to talk with an anonymous person, we won't say who, um, who has recently gone through the Responsible Driver Program with Stro Healthcare and is uh, going to share the story of his experience. So to keep his an- an- anonymity, we're going to refer to him as John. John, thank you for coming. You're welcome. So when did you finish the Responsible Driver Program? Recently? Recently. Very recently? Uh, No. A couple months ago. A couple months ago. And um, so how did it start? Like a lot of people call me and they don't know what's going to happen when they get referred to the Responsible Driver Program. The first thing you had to do was a phone interview, right? Correct. What did they ask you in the phone interview? Um, A lot of personal questions, actually, which I found... A little bit, uh, I felt too personal for um, the course itself. I, I can't quite recall all the questions. So they didn't just ask you about the underlying issue, like the underlying event that led to your referral. They asked you about things outside that? Yeah, there were questions like, is anybody in my family uh, have alcohol issues? Okay. Um, how often do I drink? Okay. Um, how many alcoholic beverages do I normally have in a week? Right. Questions like that. Not necessarily pertaining to the exact uh, incident that brings me to this conversation. Now, I've heard from a lot of people, too, that they ask you a lot of questions about your health history, like things other than alcohol use. Uh, yes, there was, um, I believe there was uh, drug questions as well. Um, so there was there was questions were, you know, that seemed to be a little bit outside and um, a little uncomfortable and I was questioning in my mind, do I answer them or do I not answer them? If I don't answer them, am I penalized? Mm-hmm. And they don't, of course, they don't give you that information. No, you don't know the questions ahead of time. No. And they don't tell you also like, you can't, you can choose not to answer this and it won't hurt you or anything like that. You're not put at ease in any way. No, I, I felt like it was a catch-22. If I didn't answer them, I might be penalized. Right. If I do answer them, it may be used against me. Of course. And then, so after you do the phone interview, then they refer you to a program. Correct. And did you do the 8 or the 16-hour program? I did the full day 8. The full day 8. Okay. Now, I heard a lot of weird things about where these are held. Was it in a normal location? I've heard stories that they've been upstairs at a McDonald's and... No, this seemed to be at a normal um, uh, uh, facility with a boardroom. It was like a boardroom table. Um, There was approximately 10 attendees and one facilitator. Okay. And what happens in the course? What do you do? You sit around and be shamed. Really? Okay. <laughs> Tell, describe that. <laughs> well, um, my understanding that this facilitator was going to uh, speak to us about, you know, the perils possibly of uh, abuse and alcohol, I mean, this, or, or, of, of alcohol or drugs while driving. It makes sense. That seems to be the course that I was to be put through. Um, but I found that when small little toy cars are brought out and we're all grown ups there and we're being told that this is the, the good driver and this is the bad driver and which do you want to be, and which should you be in a kind of a condescending tone, you know, there, I would have liked to have walked out, but again, that would not have worked in probably in my favor. No. And then you have to pay to go back a second time. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, there was a time when we were all asked to tell our story, um, and it was, it was, it was interesting to hear, to hear the stories and the, I was just concerned that the facilitator was coming across very condescending, very belittling and very shaming. How did they respond, the, the facilitator, to people when they shared their stories? Um... The facilitator seemed to respond that 
old people were there because they'd done something wrong. That they were here on purpose. Um, you know, whether or not some of the people in that room, like myself, felt we should or shouldn't be there, uh, we were all felt ashamed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was, uh, we were spoken to, to the fact that this won't be our first time there. Really? So they basically said you're going to be a repeat customer. They assumed that we would be a repeat customer. Wow. And I mean, everybody's story for how they end up in that situation is different, but I'm sure you heard from people and, you know, from your own experience, lots of people who end up with with, you know, drug or alcohol impaired driving incidents don't set out on an intentional course to drink and then get behind the wheel. There's something going on in their life that leads them to make a bad decision, or there's an emergent circumstance that comes up, or they make a mistake and they're good people otherwise. So it's really horrible to me to hear that the facilitators are, are telling these people that they're bad people who are going to do it again. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was, I felt, um, I felt badly for an older gentleman there in his seventies. Uh, this was his first vehicle offense ever. Wow. And he felt very ashamed to be there. And through, through the course uh, of the day, by the end, he admitted that, yep, it was all his fault. He shouldn't have done it. Um, I won't speak on the particulars of his case but he wasn't in his vehicle. Wow. So he was still made to take responsibility for doing something where he wasn't even doing anything that's illegal. Correct. That's, wow. That's, I mean, that's, to me, that's really horrible because the point of the course, like what the government says about why people are referred to this and why it's a mandatory referral, is it's supposed to educate people about separating alcohol from driving so they don't wind up in that situation again. And if you teach the course from the perspective that you're going to come back and you're a horrible person and you're you're a bad person who drinks and drives and causes harm just by your existence, that's the type of negative reinforcement that actually, you know, studies uh, behavioral scientists would tell you contributes to people reoffending. Yeah, it was it was a very it was a very shameful I couldn't wait to put the hours in, put it that way. I didn't f find any value out of that whole course except for the very end when they showed a, a mad video, which, okay. which anybody can watch on, on YouTube, <laughs> which was impactful because it showed, you know, a uh, consequence of, of a person that does choose to get behind the wheel when they have been drinking and they, know, and they knowingly do that. Um, but up to that point, uh, I, I felt like a, a small child being scolded and being sent to my room or to a timeout corner. And that if we reoffend, I mean, there was even um, comments on, well, you don't want to go to jail. You don't want to go there. That's not a good place to be. Um, so there was a lot of, of, of consequence if we reoffend, but there was always the assumption that we probably would. Right. Now, you brought a document with you. Um, it says Responsible Driver Program Participants Workbook. Um, this suggests to me that there's some sort of structure in their process, or what? what's the role of this workbook? Well, yeah, we went through the workbook. Um, a lot of it is talking about the current law mm -hmm. um, and, and, and referred, you know, and then the questions around the room were, you know, you, where do you see yourself here? This is why you're here. You know, this is the law. Don't break it again. You know, the police have your, your license plate recorded. You're on, on, on a watch list, basically. So they tell you you're on a watch list. Yeah, I think my notes even described how many seconds or how many times a minute the police uh, cameras will scan license plates and that yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. And that, uh, you know... Those, and, but that's a false information. The police license plate scanners, um, they get down, data downloaded into them every morning. And the only data that's put into them is about people who have outstanding warrants 
for their arrest and people who have um, a status as a prohibited driver. So it's to check for people who aren't supposed to be driving because they're prohibited. If you're in the course, your license has been reinstated because you've complied with your obligation to enroll in the course. So you're not a prohibited driver and you shouldn't be having your information downloaded into those police computers. So that to me is concerning. So, if that's actually happening. So I'm learning that that may be misinformation. Yes, they've lied to you. Because I know I've cross-examined extensively in criminal um, trials and in, impair, uh, in driving while prohibited trials about uh, the automatic license plate scanners. And I've done FOIs about it. They're not putting that data in there. Interesting. What other things struck out or stuck out to you that you were told about the program? Well, a couple of the, the, the pages were the penalties of reoffending. So mm -hmm. it was really pushed hard that, um, well, it's, I guess it started out by the walk around the room, the talk around the room, asking each person, what does it cost you so far financially and time? And is it worth it? And should you have done what you did and are you willing to pay that again um, you know so it's it's reviewing the punitive um, penalties that we've all paid and whether or not that is sufficient for us not to reoffend. right but, but to me that's not dealing with the potential core issue as to why a person may have chosen to drink and get behind a wheel or, or have alcohol in their system and be near the vehicle right it's it's to me it's um showing the heavy hand that will come down again if you even come close to any of any drinking or impairment uh right. if you steal again. we'll cut off your hand not you know why are people committing theft and what social issues are leading to this what problems do they have and how can mm -hmm. we address that to steer them on the right path yes i think it's yes exactly and was there any discussion in the program about like um, like that, like a rehabilitation aspect? You know, I look through my notes real quick. But it, not really. It was a little more. So there was no like counseling aspect of it. Nobody got to sort of work through some underlying feelings that led to the decision for lots of people when they when they drink and drive. In my experience, there's something more going on in their life. They're going through a divorce or a breakup or they're having a lot of stress at work. There's something else that's putting them out there, putting mm -hmm. the alcohol in their hand and then getting them behind the wheel. That's a long yeah, I, I didn't recall hearing any story. It was more the the actions that a person took. You know, I, where were you? Were you at a bar? Were you at home? Not why were you drinking in the first place? See, now that to me is so, it's such a missed opportunity because the government, again, they're selling this on something that's going to rehabilitate people that's necessary, that's in the public interest. But if they're just making people tell their story from the, the who's and the what's and not the why's, they're not going to get to the core of any of the issues that address public safety. You don't need a course to tell you where you were um, and what you had to drink and when you drove in relation to that. You know those facts. Mm -hmm. People who are in that situation may or may not, depending on the person, need some help understanding how their personal circumstances led them to be in that position and what better coping mechanisms they can use in the future. Yeah, I agree. I don't. I don't think the, the the core issues that put all of the parties there in that room were addressed, uh, which goes to that point that probably the high percentage will reoffend mm -hmm. because if the core issue was never dealt with, brought up and dealt with, or proper counseling or whatever requirement may be uh, to help that person, then the probability of reoffending would be. Here again. Now, you mentioned something to me a while ago, I don't know if you want to share this, about comments about lawyers that were made. Yeah, I wasn't too pleased about that. There was a, a work page um, on cost calculations and what, what has it cost us uh, financially in the way of fines, um, vehicle impoundments, potential lawyer fees, uh, court fees, um, and then other soft costs, costs um, like cost to relationships, uh, emotional costs. Um, 
cost to lawyers when we were asked to around the room did anybody uh, hire a lawyer uh, the comments were generally well, well did, that was a waste of time from the facilitator yes wow that it, it, it came across numerous times that hiring a lawyer wasn't in your best interest it would be a waste of time and money and that road safety is not are not people to ha pick a fight with. So you were actively discouraged then from, you know, assuming their foundation that you're just going to do it again is true, actively discouraged from defending yourself the next time around. Yes. That's, I mean, that to me, as part of a course um, that's administered by a government requirement, amounts to a violation of your right to counsel. You have a right to have a lawyer. You also have a constitutional right to dispute a government action against you, whether it's taking away your license for too many tickets, whether it's referring you to this program, which the dispute process is through disputing the you know an underlying issue itself, um, whether it's an impaired driving criminal charge. You have a constitutional right to review that action. And for a government to force you into a program that then directs you not to do that in the future and threatens that it's not worth picking a fight with these people, that to me is just appalling. Well, I, I mean, for me, especially uh, at, the, at the roadside situation and then subsequent to that, it's really complicated. And I don't understand this, mm -hmm. which is why I felt I needed to speak to somebody that understood this to counsel me on what do I do and how do I move forward? Um, and to be discouraged in the room and be the comments that it would be a waste of time and why did you bother, it, I think is out of place. Yeah. It's, it's really inappropriate, especially for a facilitator, in my opinion. Wow. Now, was there any opportunity to give feedback at the end of the program about the facilitator's performance? Yes. Okay. I left mine anonymous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were you were permitted to give anonymous feedback. Um, I don't recall, but I remember not putting my name on the top. Right. Well, yes. that's, yeah. I but understand. then again, it, it, it's handed to the facilitator. Right. So they can see. I mean, I don't. And... To me, I don't understand why it's not closed envelope or, or written done online later, mm -hmm. a little more anonymous. Um, there was there was one. A uh, point that I was quite disturbed on um, when the facilitator asked me to stop speaking. Really? Um, the question came around for the facilitator asked if a person was found in their vehicle and they had alcohol in their system. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not driving their car, they're just in their vehicle. She asked the room. Should the police be able to uh, would that person fall under the IRP program? Like mm -hmm. should they not be basically pulled out of their car, have their car confiscated the whole right. the whole program? Um, I, I said no. Well yeah, I mean at or at least it depends. <laughs> yeah, and I said and I, I, I quickly said no. like when it came to my turn, everybody was asked. I think I was third in row of about 10. I said no. And she said, and she was quite disturbed actually. And I just went on to continue speaking. And I said, no, I don't believe that if a person has not driven the vehicle, if the vehicle is not moving, it is not causing harm to community. Mm -hmm. Therefore, no. And th that's my opinion. That yeah. may not be how the law is or isn't written, but it's that's my not. opinion. <laughs> that's your opinion. And yes. That's your opinion. And, um, and I, I, wa I started to elaborate a little bit and she asked me to stop speaking. Wow. And then went around the room and everybody else said yes. Well, and then got on. the message. <laughs> well, it was interesting because on break, there was one fellow that came to me outside the room and said, I agree with you in that statement. I just didn't want to say anything. I just want to get through this course. Right. Now, did you talk to the people that were in the course other than like in the breaks afterwards and get their feedback on what they thought of the whole thing? Yeah, I think it was, from the people I spoke to, it was fairly unanimous. We did have time to go for lunch. 
um, and we did speak even on the first half that it it was not much of a a counseling or educational um, course. Well, it was educational in the fact that there was a lot of penalties and costs being being shared with us that if we reoffend, this is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but that it was quite belittling and shameful the overall feeling of the whole course did they give you any any explanation of things you can do uh like like other options available to you taxis buses call a friend how to how to deal with the situation if you find yourself you've gone out you've had a couple drinks and you didn't intend to originally but now you're there in the in the bar with your car what what did they tell you about that if anything yeah i think there was there was that in there for sure that you know if you choose to drink alcohol again what are you going to do Uh, how are you going to manage that are you going to leave your car at home Um, know that if you even are near your vehicle um, and then that was a whole discussion whether you're near your vehicle or not you know, how are you going to get yourself home? So, yeah, I mean, there was some positive points to the course, definitely. Um, but that was a small portion of it. Right. What did the course cost you in the end? Uh, the course itself and the parking, and not including my time, was just under $1,000. Did they have that in the list of consequences, the cost for this course? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so everybody had to think about it while they were there. Do you feel like you got... You know, a thousand dollars worth out of your day? No. No. I've I've rarely had a day that I thought was worth a thousand dollars. Like maybe a really good day at Disneyland. A thousand dollars is is a lot. lot. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, a, a facilitator and an eight-hour course, and I've I've been to, to, you know, seminars and courses over the course of my lifetime, and it's got to be pretty amazing. There's got to be huge takeaways to spend a thousand dollars. Yeah. You know. So I felt financially a little bit taken yeah. for the value that I got. And of course, it. you were forced to do this. You had no choice. You couldn't refuse to register for the course. You couldn't opt out for financial reasons. There's nothing around us right. there. No. And if I had not taken the course within the allotted time to take it, I would not. I would have had my license pulled, and it would not have been reinstated until after I took the course. Wow. And you also have to, like, successfully pass the course. Like, they grade you, essentially. Yes, which was was interesting because the questions that were asked in the course, and I was just going through my notes, you know, again, how many many times do you drink alcohol now, like currently, Mm. a week, and things like that. And, you know, she's, the facilitator said, don't worry, none of these will be used against you. But then how are they grading the course? Like, how, how do you pass or not pass? So t- to be able to be authentic and transparent in the course, because you feel you're there for your best interest, because ideally that would have been what the course is made for. But yet you cautiously answer the questions because you feel that you may fail because you don't know who's grading it in the end. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's, there's a caution as to how, how is this graded? What do I say or not say? Right. And have you received word yet of whether you passed? Yes, I did get word and I did pass. Okay, so no interlock referral for you? No. No. Do they tell you in the course what might lead them to suggest that you should also have an interlock? Uh, I can't quite recall. Um, yeah, I can't quite recall. They did, they did speak on the interlock system. Right. Um, it was very much hung over our head. <laughs> and the cost to to the person financially, it's actually um, cheaper than the course. The it's social which, cost, oh yes, right. as well. Oh, your friends have to see you blow into it. Yes. Well, your friends know they're safe then. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, it's actually surprising that the the interlock itself is cheaper than the course. It's about two hundred dollars now um, to install it. They got a new contract with a different company, and so it's made it a lot more financially viable. And for the interlock. They offer payment plans and assistance for people who are of limited means. Uh-huh. Whereas with the RDP, they don't. No, there's no options. And my understanding at the time of this course, that the interlock was like $1,200 or something. No, it's not that bad. 
Okay. It's about 250 and then there's monthly monitoring. It was 1200 when they used Guardian, but now they use Smart Start. So they, uh, it's there, a lot cheaper. Yeah, there was a speak on the possible driver risk premium uh, to be added. Right. Well, they're changing that. ICBC is changing the driver risk premium um, coming up uh, in the next like month. Um, so things can go from there. But right now you need two roadside prohibitions to get a driver risk premium. So Now, maybe you can clarify because my understanding of the course is that if I were to be pulled over and I were to be requested to provide a breath sample mm -hmm. and it came up yellow, mm -hmm. then I go through the whole system again, the whole course. Yes, because you already have the six points um, for the remedial program points on your license. The WARN reading would trigger another three points, which would make nine points total. And that would result in another referral to the uh, responsible driver program. Essentially, it's um, in five years, um, they look cumulatively. So these six points don't uh, eliminate from your driving record for five years from when you complete the course. But yet, my understanding is what she said in the, the facilitator is, is that although the driver abstract is clean in five years, mm -hmm. road safeties information goes on forever. Yes, ICBC's driving records are forever. So if you get a if you go to get a copy of your driver record at ICBC, they'll just give you the last five years. But if you're charged with an offense related to driving, um, they have your driving history from when you first got licensed. So the speeding ticket I got when I was 15, <laughs> uh, would, or 16, not 15, I didn't drive then, um, would show up on my driving record. Um, my license suspension for that speeding ticket would show up on my driving record, even though if I got an abstract right now, it would be clean. Okay, so that's, that's, I wasn't sure, I wanted to be clear on that. Yeah. And I'm only asking to be clear on some things because in the course there was some statements she made that she put forth as fact that, that I questioned. Mm -hmm. I don't think she liked me questioning, but I think that's part of understanding. Um, uh, for example, uh, if a driver's license is suspended or revoked, are all licenses affected, including boats, aircrafts, snowmobiles, everything? So no, um, because boats are a separate licensing scheme that's done through, I believe Transport Canada administers it now. Um, back when I got my boat license, it was just done on a weird test you took. I think it's the same now, same test, but it's more regulated. Um, your aircraft uh, would be up to Aviation Canada, although if you have a pilot's license and you get an alcohol-related driving incident, generally Aviation Canada will punish you. So you, you know, you should be concerned about that if you have a commercial pilot's license. If you have a um, recreational pilot's license, it's different. And if you have a pilot's license that allows you to fly in U.S. airspace, there are certain reporting requirements to the U.S. Um, aviation authorities that we actually talked about on an earlier podcast with Scott Wonder. So, no, not all licenses are automatically revoked, but probably don't drive the snowmobile. Okay. And the reason I asked that is because she came across that, that this is fact. No. And so when I questioned <laughs> it, because I was reading the notes in the book here, that I said, well, it's not in the book. It doesn't say that. And she, she said, and I wrote her quote here, <laughs> she asked uh, that she asked a pilot that she knew, mm -hmm. client, and she believed him. Well, that is a really terrible way for them to be giving you information. And that actually shocks me that somebody's asking, somebody's a facilitator, they're asking somebody in the program for a bit of information and then teaching it as though it's fact without verifying it. I mean, even a very basic understanding of, of constitutional law in Canada would show that she's wrong about the pilot issue because all aviation is a federal jurisdiction and driver's licensing is of provincial jurisdiction. Yeah, there was, there was a couple other points that seemed to come across as, as fact she was not able to verify and of course we're not able to access computers or or 
proper information to verify. Now, I don't suppose they want a lawyer in there either, given how they feel about them. <laughs> you know, it might make us a little more comfortable. Yeah. Wow. So what would you do if you could manage this course, if you could redo the course and make it something that you think would be helpful, having gone through it, what changes would you make? I would get a new facilitator. Mm -hmm. um, I think a, a certified or a, a, like a family therapist, a psychologist, or somebody that's dealing with maybe the soft side of why the issues as to why people are in that room. Yeah. And not just the why they're in that room, but the frustration even of the people that are in that room. And in some cases, some of us didn't feel we should even be in that room. Right. And if we're feeling that way, why are we feeling that way? And is it justified or not? Um, and what can, what can we do? And, and in this case, we were discouraged from getting legal advice. Um, whereas, in my opinion, getting the right you know, emotional help and legal help, and in some cases, maybe some financial help, we weren't given those avenues to pursue. We weren't given references as to where to go for that. We were just, uh, it was reiterated on the penalties that would be imposed if we do this again. So did they even provide you with, you know, counseling resources or things like that that you could access after the course that would assist you if you were struggling with alcohol addiction? I'm sure there's people in the course that were. Um, did they provide anything for that? I'm just going through my notes here and um, I, I don't recall any any references to that any sure. references to hey here's some counselors you can speak to here's some step programs to speak to you know I, I, I don't have it in my notes I don't have it in the paperwork you think that if like you know rehabilitation is supposed to be a focus and if there are people who are actually struggling with an issue that's going to lead to them potentially reoffending that the most important thing to do is to direct those people after the eight hours is up to the right resources to continue what they need, the work they need to do. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and that being said, I think a follow-up program would be helpful. I mean, for $1,000. Yeah. I mean, to have an actual health professional uh, potentially be the facilitator. Because if it's a facilitator, I mean, I don't know that this facilitator had a background in law. No. So, how can, so, <laughs> how, not. so how can she speak on legal matters? Um, and me be confident that they're correct. What, um, how many people were in the program with you? I think there was about 10, nine or 10 participants in one facilitator. So about $10,000 for that one day. Yes. Going to Stro. And there was two groups going on at the same time there. Wow. So $20,000 day for them. You'd think that it can't possibly cost that much to bring in, you know, registered clinical counselor for at least an hour of it. Well, that, yes, exactly. I was going to say it could have been part, you know, part legal, part counseling. I didn't feel there's a lot of counseling. It was a regurgitation of the criminal code and penalties and shameful cost to us and bringing up the little toy cars, which I thought was just really sad and yeah. embarrassing, you know, like we're, uh, we're grownups. Well, humiliate you into yes. submission. Yes. Um, and, and, and from, I'm a parent and if I were to parent my children like that so is is it is it the right way to facilitate by using by using shaming and and uh penalties holding penalties overhead or are we dealing with the core issues of why are we here what are we feeling about being here like i think no nobody i don't i don't believe anybody would have actually answered honestly if we were asked how do you feel being here because you were all too scared to speak your truth in that room yes wow well, it sounds like a really ineffective program, um, which doesn't surprise me, honestly, but I'm very cynical about these things. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day to share your story and this information with us. It's going to help a lot of people because there are so many of my clients that come to me with questions about what to expect, and this is going to help them know what they're in for and navigate it better. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add? Um, no, I, I, you know, I think it, I went in with an open mind. Mm -hmm. I did, I did, you know, stay open to the things that were positive mm -hmm. that I did learn from it. 
Have I changed my drinking habits since? Yes. I also ride a motorcycle. There's zero tolerance on that, mm -hmm. um, which always has been. Um, so there were some takeaways, yes. But the overall course, in my opinion, I got about an hour's worth of the eight. And to spend $1,000 to get an hour's worth of benefit didn't, didn't seem... I think part of just putting in the eight hours part of the punitive, yeah. you know, penalty that I needed to bear. Okay. Well, I'm really sorry that you had to go through that and that you didn't get your money's worth because that's just from my perspective, unacceptable. And thank you again for joining me on the Driving Law Podcast. You're welcome. Thank you to John for taking his time out of his day to share his experience in the Responsible Driver Program with us. What he has shared is disturbing deeply disturbing to me. And I want to know if it's common experience. So if anybody out there who listens to the Driving Law podcast has had a similar experience, please reach out to me on Twitter or online. VancouverCriminalLaw.com is our website. Or give me a call at 604-685-8889. Let me know what you had to go through. And if we can find some time, we'll share some of your experiences on the podcast in an upcoming episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Driving Law podcast. Tune in next week for another interesting episode.